And today we have a special guest here with me. His name is the Bozo Profundo, the Facebook group. Please introduce yourself, sir. Hi, my name is Matt Spriggs. How are you doing today? I'm good. I'm good. So most people don't know who you are unless they're part of the Facebook group, which then they know who you are immediately. Right. <laughs> right. Um, but uh, tell us, tell us more about yourself and how did you find out that you were. Of course, you don't believe it yourself, but most of the community believes that you are activist slash boss of profundo level. Okay. Um, let's see. You want the long or the short version here? <laughs> um, um, you say you're a little short on time, so let's do the short yeah. version and hope for the best. <laughs> okay. I'll, uh, I'll try to condense it down here. Um, started singing when I was actually very young. I would go to the, um, you know, the gospel sings, the quartet. Um, bass singers were my heroes, George Yance, J.D. Sumner, all those guys, and I uh, wanted to emulate them. My voice dropped at a pretty early age. I was about 12 or 13 years old, and uh, it dropped. Did some choral singing and other stuff like that, but didn't really pursue it much until about the age of 19 or 20. I started singing in a quartet and traveling around. And um, I got away from singing totally. I hadn't been using my voice at all. Then about a year ago, I actually joined this group, and um, I was really out of out of shape vocally, you know. <laughs> and uh, so I came in and I did some pretty um, pretty bad notes, but I started posting and uh, practicing again, and uh, started taking voice lessons. So to answer your question, um, when did I notice my voice was a a really deep bass? Early, early on, um, but I just identify as a bass. I don't, uh, I don't call myself a profundo or an activist or anything like that. I'm, I'm just a bass. Yeah, that's what you say. But in the video that you sent me, and the video that the people are gonna see, oh. uh, watch this video right before it starts. They're, they're gonna be like, oh yeah, no, that's garbage. That what he's saying right now. <laughs> <laughs> so as a singer, um, sometimes it's kind of hard to to realize your full potential if you have the wrong teachers and the wrong people that are trying to raise you up. Uh, I'm yeah. sure I've heard your story before, but I'm sure the audience doesn't know. Um, could you tell us your story and uh, your musical journey as far as teachers wise? Absolutely. Forgive me for drinking my coffee here. It's uh, I'm still getting no, going today. No worries. I was about to eat breakfast and I realized, oh, wait, I have an interview. <laughs> yeah, yeah, me too. So I might have to have a snack here too. Um, no sure. Um, had some really good instruction uh, as a kid, took piano, saxophone, and um, had some good choral teachers in high school. After that, I really didn't, you know, have any kind of instruction, and, and my voice was so out of shape. So here I was at the age of, uh, I think I just turned 42, and I decided to start studying again. And I went through um, three different teachers who all said that I was actually a baritone or a bass baritone. And this seemed kind of strange to me because I'm thinking, man, I don't really view my voice as a baritone. So, um, yeah, yeah. I'm, a, I'm a baritone and well, our timbres are very different as far as sounding wise. Right. I, I think what it is, um, I have a, I have a fairly long voice, if you will. Um, mm -hmm. 
you know, I, I can go up to like a, a G4 in full mm-hmm. voice. Yeah. Um, but that isn't the problem, just touching it. The problem is if you keep me up like at a middle C or higher, and I had one teacher actually do that. Um, one lesson we went for, I think it was close to a half an hour. And I mean, I was just so wore out. I would leave lessons and I would literally be hoarse. One of them, I was, I was aphonic for a full day. Wow. And I lost my voice for almost a week. So that, that was kind of like the, okay, this isn't working moment. Mm-hmm. For me. And um, I'll tell you, honestly, the, the most encouragement that I've had is within the group. Um, you know, you've mentioned some difficult times you've had. Well, I'll just tell you, I was ready to just completely give up singing. And, um, you know, I, I was really down about it. And I'll tell you, I got more encouragement from like the mods, Axel, um, really great people within the group, um, encouragers, Eric Holloway, uh, Richard Harris, Jessica. There are so many great people within that group. And now seeing you come along, it's been a, a nice breath of fresh air. And uh, there's a lot of, a lot of good motivation and encouragement there. Yes, thanks. Um, so um, you, you might seem a little out of place uh, in front of, compared to the other people that I'm interviewing. If you feel. Yeah. But hey, um, in my eyes, you're on their level as far as um, note-wise and resonance-wise. Obviously, you don't have the same reputation that they do yet. Keyword right. yet. In right. 10 years, Matt, you're going to be the next uh, Glenn Miller. I, I'm counting on it. Wow. Well, that's a that's an awfully huge uh, compliment, and uh, I really appreciate that. Thank you. Glenn's a, Glenn's a hero to all of us. So um, I don't know if you can give us an example, but um, um, how do you resonate the contra notes with your chest slash modal voice? Um, because I know a lot of basses struggle projecting down in that area. Um, even though they might be able to speak that low, I have a friend that's very young that has the same problem. Mm-hmm. Um, so um, can you tell us what exactly you do to project the contra notes? Okay. You know, I thought about this too before we um, agreed to this interview because I was I was listening to uh, Bass to Yang. I mean, are you kidding? That guy is just a walking encyclopedia. I mean, there's so <laughs> much great information, right? His channel, no I just go on there sometimes and... Uh, it's just invaluable the the information and Eric and yeah. other people and I'm like, okay, I'm I'm not sure I'm going to be able to explicitly verbalize all this, but I'll do my best to to um, say what I perceive is going on. It's a number of things that are that are happening with the voice. Um, there's actually some disagreement. One, um, I don't know if you've heard this or not. Some people disagree that you can't mix modal voice and vocal fry. Others claim that you can. My question is, well, isn't subharmonics kind of doing that? Mm, interesting. In a, in a sense. Um, when I go really deep into the contra, and I'm talking like down to an F or an E flat, there's a, a mix that starts to occur. Mm-hmm. And that's how it gets louder and more resonant. The other thing is focusing on what I term as placement. And I know some people don't really like that term. Best thing that I can come up with. But it's finding the the true mask where you slightly raise the soft palate. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if, if I hit those notes right, like from a B flat down, I literally start to vibrate here to where my, my eyes will start to water. Mm-hmm. You know, so yeah. that's, that's how I know that I have good... <laughs> Good placement. So d- yeah. does that kind of answer your question, sort of? Yeah, it does, yes. Okay. Um, so um, obviously we don't use the same singing techniques, um, but I do know what you're talking about as far as resonance-wise. But for my, for me, my placement, um, I try to make it more round and full um, because I don't go for resonance because my technique is already resonant. I need to make it more powerful. and I mean, more, more round, I guess you could say. So most of my vibrations happen in my laryngeal area and then it comes out. I usually don't aim at my mask because it, it causes it to become sort of like a throat singing sounding more like, that, you know what I'm saying? But for right. a real chest modal voice, that's what you want to do. Um, right. Um, I forgot my hat, but I did style my hair today. <laughs> and, you know, I'll add one thing that I've really been enjoying listening to you is how you're able to take on several different characteristics with your, your lows. 
you know, it's not just one sound that you're able to generate. You've developed several different uh, techniques and I'm really enjoying uh, learning all of them and, and hearing you. It's, it's really a neat, a neat thing you've discovered. Oh, nice. Oh, well, I guess we could switch this around if you have any questions for me. <laughs> <laughs> no, sorry. I'm not the interviewer. No, yeah, yeah. I just wanted to know. But yeah, just for anyone who wants to know, um, what he's talking about is I have three different types of tones with the technique I have. One is called the roar. Um, and that's uh, in my C2 video with Tu Yang in the beginning. It's just this loud roar type of sound. The second is an organ timbre, which sounds almost like a pedal of an organ. I'm sure you've heard it before, Matt, in my type of poem video. Yeah, yeah. And the, the third is one I'm still working on. It sounds more like a Machess modo voice. You'll hear it um, before the Eric Holloway video that I'm posting today. Um, I just posted actually because it's already posted because uh, by the time I post this video, <laughs> it'll be up there. Great, but, looking forward to it. But it, it's uh, it's 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 really fun and it, it's it's amazing and it's and it's and it's great. Um, so now as a bass, um, I know that you usually don't work with mics. Um, what's your opinion on mics? Should basses use mics? Is is it something that we should rely on? Okay, for me, absolutely. Um. I, that was one of the things when I first came to the group, I think one of the first videos that I did, I descended down to like a D1 or a double OC and I was able to get there, but it could just barely be heard very, very faint. And that was because, um, from the days of singing in acapella groups and then, uh, Southern gospel quartets, I always relied on amplification. Um, but that it isn't like it's not legit. It's a different technique if you will yeah and um to me it's just like if someone says well that's not modal voice that's a technique so therefore it's not legit i singing is all about technique right so um if you can hit say a low e in subharmonics and if it sounds better or more full than if i hit a modal low e what does it matter all i'm after is what sounds good yes so, but back to the microphones, um, yeah, think about it. If you're going to say that a bass, not saying you, but if anyone is saying bass singers shouldn't use microphones, doesn't the tenor or the baritone or the lead singer, aren't they using microphones too? Mm -hmm. And if yeah. you've got loud music playing through a soundtrack or speakers, you're going to have to have some kind of amplification. Correct. So yeah. I have no um, I have no issues with you know with with amplification. I think that the big thing for me is um, just understanding the the differences between the types of bases, and um, that's why I really am huge a huge fan of the octavist voices like a Glenn Miller, John Ames, mm -hmm. guys that can stand there and drop down to a, a G or an F no amplification and just fill a room that is just uh that's amazing to me yeah it really is speaking of which glenn miller's uh interview is going to happen on thursday all right looking forward to that as yeah. well as alex lukianov next tuesday man doesn't he have a crazy wicked sound down there i heard some clips of him and i mean talk about power that's yeah, just all the way down to D1, right? Yeah, yeah, really good sound. Yeah, I'm really, I'm really looking forward to that. Anyways, enough about them and more about you. Sure. So as 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 a singer, you know, sometimes we struggle with learning um, why is it necessary to stay in my range. Um, as far as you, you have a great range, you know, G4 all the way down to F1. Um, but sometimes we have to find where our perfect and comfortable range is because if we strain our voice then like like uh like there's a verse in the bible you know um god giveth and god taketh away or something like that or is it just a quote from somebody i don't know what it is <laughs> but something along those lines um so if you use it wrong it will leave you um so where what should we do as singers to find out what's comfortable for us as singing wise and why should we not strain our voices well, I mean, 
my experience of, uh, you know, being paired with a teacher who was constantly straining my voice is one example. Um, you know, be, being pushed to that to that level where you're on that, for me, the, if you will, upper tessitura where I was just, you know, always out of my comfort range, it has a real deleterious impact on the voice. And um, now there's a flip side to that. Only through what I call bumping notes, but you know, when you find your floor, say it's like a an F, I've I've full voiced an E flat one on a few occasions. Doesn't happen real often, but uh, <laughs> um, but only by um, kind of pushing the envelope are you able to expand that range. But there's a right way to do it, and just like with warm ups, um, I think that warming the voice up is is critically important but there's a difference between being warmed up and worn down Mm. so you know you you have to keep that in perspective but yeah absolutely i have i have found my um my range or window if you will um i don't normally go even though i can go up to like a a g4 it's very rare that i'll go above like in an e flat um it's just it's just not comfortable for me and it it strains Mm -hmm. my voice yeah Great. Thanks for your input on that. I'm pretty sure a lot of people will appreciate what you have to say. Yeah. Um, um, we're touching on stuff that I, I wanted to touch with, but um, uh, a lot of people, I've had more questions for other people uh, that were uh, uh, more asked than, than that. Uh, for you, uh, a lot of people have been asking, um, uh, specifically at uh, Brojo Base, is um, uh, what, 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 what goes on in your head and how, how do you hit the contra notes all the way down to like D1 and stuff like that? So that's what we're wondering as, as the young bass is, how, how do you do that? Is it your technique that you've been using? Um, what goes on in my head? Boy, that's a <laughs> not a lot when I'm doing it. Um, <laughs> there actually is a lot of technique going on there. Um, it it has taken a bit of time because if, if you're – if your limit or if your floor is say an, an F or a low E, and then you're trying to push down to like a C1, how do you get there? Well, that again gets back to my point of how you can you can learn how to do a, I call it a covered fry, but there's basically a mix between modal voice and fry where the two start to kind of kind of merge together. At least that's what I perceive is going on. Mm-hmm. And you're able to warm it up and uh, the trick, though, is like on those descents, keeping it all smooth yeah. without any kind of perceivable transition. And um, that's the that's the real tricky part. Yeah, I'm going to play a clip for the audience right now. Awesome. Will you ever sing the All Night Vigil? You know, I am I am very doubtful of that. I have a huge, huge respect for that. And it's it's just such beautiful music. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've gone on YouTube and elsewhere and just listened to it and just been in awe. Um, I don't really view my voice as, as um, that type of voice. I, again... It isn't that I'm not um, able to maybe perform the role of an activist or profundo. Um, I, I guess I can wear that hat, but I don't really see myself as that. Um, what I see myself doing more is um, probably forming a quartet again mm-hmm. and uh, and doing more of that type of singing. Yeah, I definitely could see that happening. You've been getting a lot of comparisons Um to like Tim Riley and uh, people like that um, in uh, my little group chat that I have on uh, Instagram. <laughs> wow, well that's a that's a huge compliment. I had a I had a bit of time when I was about um, probably from the age of eighteen to my early twenties. I followed Tim around. I mean, anywhere there was a concert locally, you know, I would I would go and. Uh, I went and recorded down at what was called Goldmine Studios in Gadsden, Alabama, and spent a little bit of time with Tim. And uh, he was very helpful in uh, working with me on placement and other things like that. So 
that's a huge compliment. <laughs> so now uh, here at Talk Box for the Octopus, we have a tradition whenever we end an interview. And if you've seen the interviews, Matt, you know what's going to happen up next. <clears throat> Um, of ending the interview. Oh my, you're probably gonna ask for a so, long. Sh- ready? So, what is your lowest note? Ah, uh, boy, I don't know. Let's see here. Uh... A little bit croaky. <laughs> Still good though. Amazing job. All right, thanks, Matt Spriggs. Thanks for the interview. Um, I hope to see you again soon. And uh, thanks for this uh, interview. It's been a great interview. Uh, uh, it's a little shorter than my most ones, but it's still been very informative. Thank you so much. Hey, it's been my pleasure. I really appreciate it. I'm looking forward to the other interviews. All right, see you guys later. All right.